I wanted to point out here, so the first year of science will, is called Cycle 1, and it'll consist of a mix of programs. Um, acronyms are defined here, GEO, GTO, and ERS programs, as well as calibration programs will um, be what the first year of science is consisting of. And of course, it's just the beginning. WEB is planned to have a mission duration after commissioning of five to 10 years. So there are three flavors that I want to touch on here of planetary observations that will be done with WEB. And um, in really broad terms, um, this is not an inclusive list, um, but in broad terms, there's imaging and spectroscopy of solar system bodies, direct imaging of exoplanets and disks, and then time series observations of transiting exoplanets. And so I want to touch on each of these a little bit, uh, some of which, again, Doug Hudgens touched on the solar system science already on Tuesday or Wednesday. And I just want to reiterate that um, there's this early release science program for the solar system science uh, that'll be performed for Jupiter. And so observations of Jupiter, as well as Io and Ganymede will be conducted as part of this program. And we'll be able to get a first look at um, really the capabilities of Webb for doing a solar system object like Jupiter, a bright solar system object as well. And then on top of that, there's a slew of solar system bodies that will be targeted in the GTO programs. And I wanted to show just two examples here. Um, this is a slide courtesy of Heidi Hamill, who's uh, leading a lot of the GTO uh, work. And this shows a footprint of uh, MIRI's uh, medium resolution IFUs on top of Uranus. So this is an image of, uh, of Uranus from Keck. And so it's just showing that we can get, you know, these global views of these planets with Webb and at wavelengths that with MIRI in the mid infrared, we can't really access um, easily now. And so we'll be able to get a nice observations um, looking at, uh, there's a bullet list of, of examples here, but looking at vertical and horizontal cloud structures, um, mapping latitudinal methane variation, things like that. So that will, you know, again, hopefully inform our understanding of exoplanets as well. And then this is a simulation of um, Europa's water plumes and what we might see with the near spec instrument on web. And so this is a full footprint here of the near spec um, IFU and looking at simulated spectra generated with the um, planetary spectrum generator. And you can see, so I'm not a solar system scientist, <laughs> but um, you can see a variety of features that we expect to see uh, with web here from Europa's water plumes. So this is really exciting because, you know, again, as we've heard about this whole week, we can hopefully connect a lot of this to exoplanets and our understanding of their atmospheres and structures as well. And so on that note, I wanted to turn to exoplanet science, um, looking at direct imaging first. So just like with um, the solar system observations, there's a slew of observing modes that we can use. And direct imaging has um, options to use coronography, actual direct imaging with um, three of the instruments, or a technique called aperture masking interferometry. And so these are just um, example images and, and simulations um, of some of these modes. And within these uh, direct imaging programs, there is, uh, just like with the solar system science, there is um, a single early release science program that will be conducted, again, early right after commissioning to look at um, three systems, so I'll show that on the next slide, um, but the PI Sasha Hinckley, and um, this program will be looking at a range of wavelengths um, out to 28 microns with Webb and being able to characterize this um, early for the community, characterize Webb's capabilities for direct imaging. So uh, these currently are the three targets that are planned to be observed as part of this program. So um, the first one, um, this HIP-65426, uh, um, these are uh, near Kim and Mary simulated images of what we expect to see of this planet. I believe it's a uh, young uh, hot Jupiter or young, yeah, Jupiter system. And um, there, there's this other um, planetary companion around BHS-1256. And uh, th these are um, actual near infrared images, no, no web simulations here, but it's shows basically if there's a nicely separated planet, um, separated spatially. So Webb will be able to um, collect uh, hopefully really precise observations of that system um, and using a variety of observing modes as, as outlined on the right here. 
And then there's also a DISC system included in the ERS program. So this is um, the system here. So these are existing observations on these two left panels and then simulations here with NIRCAM and MIRI. So what we expect to see of the DISC uh, structure at, for example, 3.6 and 15.5 microns. And so these are, again, the first cases where we'll have observations um, using direct imaging, but then there's about 30 unique systems that will be observed as part of GTO programs and including the HR8799 uh, system. So, and there's a slew of observing modes that will be used for all of these. Uh, so we'll get a nice breadth of science from these programs. And it's a mix of, of um, exoplanets and disks within these 30 systems. So the transiting case, I wanted to spend um, a little more time on. Uh, so there's a time series, there's a, ser a number of time series modes, um, actually seven different ones available for observations. So we have options um, and they cover range of wavelength space and um, resolution, resolving power. So we, um, there's a number of things that we can test essentially with the early release science program. And uh, in this case, the PI is Natalie Battaglia um, with co-PIs listed there. And um, here, the program will be to observe three uh, known hot Jupiter planets. So planets that give really high signal to noise um, so that we can really push, especially for um, bright stars also, push the kind of limits of web to see, you know, what are the possible noise floors that we can actually achieve? Um, what systematics are we dealing with when we have time series observations compared to other types of observations? And so the, um, there's an overview of this program given in um, a paper by Bean et al. in 2018. Um, but the three Jupiters targeted are listed here. They all happen to be discovered by the WASP ground-based survey. Um, but there will be one target observed only in transit, four transits total. And then uh, WASP-43b, there will be a phase curve um, that covers two eclipses and one transit. And then an eclipse of this um, planet with a really bright host star using um, the nearest instrument in particular. And the type of data that we expect to see from this program is shown here. So there's... Um, all the colored points are simulated web data from uh, the four transits of this target that will be collected. And if you look really closely, there's actually um, gray points back here that are real Hubble data um, that uh, detected a water feature in this planet. And so with web, we'll be able to get in all the colored points to um, basically measure more precise abundance of the planet, uh, of the planet's metallicity, and look at TIO, CO, CO2, things like that. And I do encourage you um, to look at, there's a paper, a recent paper by Kristen Thompson, um, I think it's still here, maybe? Yeah, she's back there <laughs> um, on the system. And uh, so she uh, also has, there's also tests and Spitzer data for this planet and I believe other ground-based data. So um, this is a really well-characterized system that um, is a great target for web to um, characterize the instruments on web. And I wanted to also note that, so that was the ERS program, but the GTO programs, they'll, similar to direct imaging, there'll be about 30 exoplanets, part of the transit program. And I wanted to highlight that five of these come from TESS, which is really exciting um, because TESS was essentially, so TESS launched in, in 2018, and it was essentially built as a, a um, finder scope for James Webb. So these are small planets around bright stars that TESS is starting to discover that are really um, ideal targets for Webb to study the atmospheres of. And then there are nine targets that are smaller than about 1.6 Earth radii, so possibly terrestrial. And I have a list on the next slide of those. Um, so yeah, there'll be a variety of observations performed on these planets. And um, this slide is courtesy adapted from a uh, slide from Tom Green, um, who has a GTO program. And um, you can see here, this is showing the planet's um, equilibrium temperature versus mass of all the ERS and GTO transiting exoplanet targets. So it really just shows like a nice distribution of mass and temperature space that we're probing. And you can see all the terrestrial planets, um, potentially terrestrial planets listed here, smaller than 1.6 Earth radii. And then you can see um, their masses um, here. So less than about four Earth masses, 
a lot of planets from TRAPPIST-1, which makes sense, um, which we've heard about already this week. And then um, there's a slew of giant planets covering, um, again, all kinds of temperatures and sizes. And then all the colors indicate different observing modes or different wavelengths that, that will be covered for these planets. So um, there is a nice representation here of a planet that, where we have a measured mass and radius, so density, that will get a, a nice range also of wavelength coverage, um, mix of transits and eclipses, you know, all that to contribute to our understanding of exoplanet atmosphere, composition, structure, um, clouds, um, et cetera. And so I, if you haven't seen it already, um, I encourage you to see a poster on the L9859 system by Daria Podoradeska. And uh, also there are multiple posters on TRAPPIST-1. So um, definitely um, some fun targets will be observed with Webb uh, in early in its um, science observations. So in my not last couple of slides, I just wanted to point out um, the timeline for a lot of this. I already talked about the commissioning timeline. So we are here um, a little after January 23rd, which was when the call for proposals reopened. So the call is officially open for general observers now. Um, we have the ERS and GTO programs that I've talked about, which are sampling a lot of targets and a lot of parameter space, but there's plenty more to do. And there's about 6,000 hours left, um, not left, but available uh, for observing programs in the cycle one um, science. And once um, we launch and after commissioning and uh, ends, after six months, there will be the early release science observations stacked as early as possible so that we can get data from those ahead of the cycle two deadline because we want to know the instrument capabilities so we can see can we push to smaller planets, right? Or what um, what can we do with different wavelengths with mid infrared that you know we haven't used at all to study exoplanets, so or barely at all. Um, so we're this is this is a timeline, and um, I think yeah I thought there was something else I was going to say, but maybe not. Um, I will say that there are proposal resources online. Um, so there's websites from Space Telescope Science Institute linked um, everywhere all over the talk to help people prepare for proposals. And I just wanted to end um, with take home points that really I want to reiterate that Webb will provide, in fact, a new view of um, both solar system and exoplanets, and as well as uh, disks, thanks to the near and mid IR wavelength coverage and also the sensitivity. And so from all of this, um, we'll be able to learn about uh, everything from atmospheric composition, chemistry, clouds, um, all of that from these planets. And so it's really uh, an exciting time for us, you know, to start thinking about more about the exoplanet solar system connection and what observations can we do with Webb to help answer some of the questions posed at, at this meeting. Um, and then the early release science observations are designed to really test the instrument capabilities um, right after commissioning um, beyond the standard commissioning calibration activities. So all the instruments will be declared ready for science during commissioning, but that doesn't mean they've tested, you know, um, the super bright stars, like how bright can we go when we're looking at transiting exoplanets or, you know, um, what are the direct imaging modes? How, what is the wave front error like? Um, all these things that will be tested to some level during commissioning, but early release will also push on this. And I should mention all that data will be, um, has no proprietary period, so it'll be public available for anybody um, right away. And then, you know, I encourage everybody here to propose for cycle one um, time. So the deadline is May 1st, um, mark your calendars now. <laughs> and uh, there's plenty of solar system and exoplanet science to be done on top of what I've already talked about. So I think between ERS, GTO, and GEO, we can fill all the gaps and hopefully um, learn a lot more about planets in and out of the solar system. So I'll leave it there. Thank you.